Welcome back to Moonlight Lore everyone, and welcome to the finale of the Legends of the Nahanni Valley series. As always, I'm your host Jordan Hopkins, and I am so incredibly grateful for you joining me in our final plunge into this mysterious oasis. Since this is the final episode, if you are new to the show or for whatever reason are starting off with part 4 of this series, I suggest going back and listening to parts 1, 2, and 3 so you can get the full context and picture of why this valley has merited 4 full episodes. But for those of you who are stubborn and are wanting to listen to this episode first for whatever reason, or for those of you who may have forgotten what the past episodes were about, I'll share a brief summary of what we talked about. In the first episode, we started the series off with the horrifying stories of decapitations taking place in the valley. Willie and Frank McLeod were who we focused on most in that episode, but we also discussed the strangely similar cases of Martin Jorgensen and a man with the nickname the Yukon Fisher. Both of them were incredibly strong, capable outdoorsmen who both ended up decapitated. Martin with his cabin mysteriously burnt down, and Fisher with his rifle bent and broken. We also talked about two other strange cases of death, but although they were not decapitations, they were odd in their own right. May Lafferty seemingly went mad and abandoned her traveling party to only become lost in the Nahanni, and John O'Brien, who was found flash frozen completely solid, still covered in blankets, holding a soon to be lit match in his outstretched hand. In the second episode, we focused on more disappearances taking place in the valley, but mainly honed in on the exciting tale of the mad trapper of Rat River the man thought to have been the real cause for all the suspicious deaths throughout the years. He led the RCMP on a 48-day manhunt, crossing over mountains, through forests, and ending in an intense gun battle. His story would become known as the country's longest and largest manhunt in its history. In that episode, we had also discussed the multiple spirits said to inhabit the valley, and the dreaded curse that is believed to blanket it, leading hundreds of people to their deaths. Then, in our last episode, we talked about the Native American history which surrounded this land, the legend of the deadly lost Naha tribe who terrorized the inhabitants of the Nahanni, and where they possibly had vanished to. We also discussed the multiple stories of the Nahanni tribe, and the influential chiefess known as the White Queen who resided over them. All three of those episodes have been working up to this last one. There have been parts of each of them that contribute to a possible theory as to why the Nahanni Valley is known to be such a deadly and mysterious lost world. In the first episode, Charlie McLeod and his team traveled through the Nahanni, searching for his lost brothers. While doing so, they felt ominous eyes watching and following them through the forest, never revealing who they belonged to, and terrifying the men each night as they got closer and closer. In part two, I shared the category of spirits who are said to haunt the valley, the elemental spirits, the lost souls, the shadow souls, and the familiar demons of the shamans. But there was also a fifth I neglected to share in that episode. They were more tangible than that of the other four kinds, and much more dangerous than even the dreaded Naha tribe. It's with this fifth category of spirit is where we will start this episode off. The ones who may actually be the ones responsible for all the deaths and disappearances that have taken place in the Nahanni over the past few centuries. The lost Naha people lived among them in the mountains, but even they, after obtaining a reputation in the valley for being dangerously talented warriors, were still fearful of what lurked in the caves. The Naked Zaltara. Although being on constant alert for the violent raiders from the mountains, the Dene people knew the Naha weren't the worst dangers one could find there. They avoided the rocky slopes as much as they could, but that didn't prevent those things from venturing down to strike terror into the lowlands. The shamans of the tribes were tasked with protecting the villages and its occupants at night, when the demonic forces emerged from their rocky homes and descended down towards the settlements to wreak havoc in the most nefarious of ways. The Naked Zaltara were fearsome spirits. Living in the caves high in the mountaintops, they hungered for mischief and death. When they deemed it time to finally go cause some, there were several different tangible forms they would choose to take. Sometimes, they would take the forms of two giant creatures, one of that being a great whale or of a humongous dragon. Now, don't ask me why anyone would want to turn into a whale over turning into a giant dragon, 
because I honestly have no clue. But I will admit it would be kind of funny to see a giant whale stranded on top of a mountain trying to intimidate people. But these are just two forms the Nekazaltara like to take, but both are rather rare apparently. They much rather turn into what we would call goblins, for lack of a better name. But even these aren't the stereotypical ones you might be thinking of. There are actually a few different versions they can adopt, all of which have been described as being like hairy wild men more than anything else. The first version is called the Nenelin, a hairy, long-armed creature said to have nails as sharp as claws which scrape across the rocks and stones as it walks. They're considered a bad omen when one crosses paths with them, but if the Nenelin were to pause their pillaging in the settlements for a moment and put down the dried fish meat they were known to steal from the drying racks, they might stop and peer into a tent, looking for a small child. But what happens next might not be what you're anticipating. When they find a small sleeping toddler or baby is present inside, they creep into the tent silently on all fours, careful not to wake the child or the protective adult sleeping next to it. Once it's close enough to finally reach out its long lanky arm and touch it, it will simply pat the sleeping child on the head, then sneak away and retreat back into their mountain homes. It is said those children who are visited by the Nenelin are destined to become a shaman, protectors and guardians of the villages. The Nenelin, while comparing it to our next creature a Nekazeltara could transform into, are relatively harmless in the grand scheme of things. They are said to mainly sneak into camps and villages, searching for food and maybe causing mischief along its way, but it's the Yesu who are far more dangerous and should be avoided at all costs. Sharing similar characteristics to the Nenelin, the Yesu have been described less like a man, but rather have more of a beastly appearance to them. They're completely covered in hair, walk on two legs, and have incredibly large claws and fangs. The name Yesu even translates to the ghastly wolf. That's right, we're delving into werewolf territory. The Yesu are said to be fearsome hunters, excelling in skills like tracking and bringing down their prey. Even the most skilled tribal hunters are outmatched when compared to this ferocious beast. Though as much as it loves to hunt other wolves or mountain lions, it delights in striking fear into humans who are caught outside in the woods after dark. While it might be rare when they do decide to hunt humans, as we are far too easy prey for it, if it has yet to find any sufficient meal for the night, they are not above swiftly ending the life of their human prey who had been caught outside after the sun goes down. Its speed is unmatched while it runs, giving it the appearance of a blurred shadow moving through the woods. It's also said to give off very little noise, aside from the rustling of leaves it pushes past or the breaking of branches it happens to step on while tracking. The only other sound it makes is the light breathing one could hear when it's inches behind you, but by the time you notice, it's too late. Although it loves the challenge of a good hunt, the yes you are intelligent about it. They wait for the perfect opportunity until their prey is asleep and defenseless or have broken off from whatever pack or group they're traveling in. For many of the stories we discussed back in part one, the McLeod brothers' fate, the deaths of the Yukon Fisher and Martin Jorgensen, and even Charlie McLeod and his band of explorers feeling the eyes following them as they move through the valley, the Yesu is considered one of the prime suspects for all of these happenings. But there are still more things out there equally as dangerous, and just as likely to have had a hand in many of the deaths and strange happenings that occur annually in the Nahani Valley. The San Teratana, Men of the Rocks. Described as feral mountain-dwelling men who live in caves similar to how the Lost Naha tribe once lived long ago. While their physical description of these monstrous creatures seem to be lacking, it is said they still possess the power of spirits while in this form. While they did present quite a threat to those venturing near the Yukon River where they were said to inhabit, they more or less remained reclusive when it came to interactions with people. But similar to the Nenelin, they would sneak into villages and camps at night in search of food, tools, or valuables they could steal while hiding in the shadows. Their reclusive nature had made them incredibly talented at hiding. With the help from supernatural powers they hold, they are able to cast spells on themselves to make them near invisible. If they needed just a little bit more extra help, they had a number of spells at their disposal they could use to help steal, hide, or even kidnap. Along with being skilled thieves, they were also adept at kidnapping villagers whenever they desired. What they do with their kidnapped humans when they return to their caves is a mystery, as no one has ever escaped from them before. For most of the sudden and mysterious disappearances that take place in the valley, 
the Sonteratana are believed to cast spells to lure the unfortunate traveler deep into the woods and then into their caves. For people like May Lafferty, who we talked about in part one, they were lured off the path and away from their group only to panic and find themselves lost in the woods, never to be seen again. For the most part, these three creatures the Nekatzeltara are said to transform into are ones to be avoided at all costs. While the Nenelin are the least likely to cause physical harm to anyone, they do like to cause trouble that could lead to harm down the road, like tampering with tools or weapons only for them to break later on when they are desperately needed. The Yesu, while rarely hunt humans, still won't hesitate to strike one down and feast on their body if they feel the urge arise. And the Sonteratana, being feral mountain hermits, are still known to be exceptional thieves and kidnappers who find pleasure in causing distress for humans. The Nekadzeltaura are spirits who, above all else, delight in the suffering of humans. When the ancient Dene warband was sent to destroy the Naha tribe centuries ago, only to find their camp deserted and void of any human life, they believed it was these spirits who were the ones who did away with them. They were also feared and blamed for one last thing though. Seeing how their numbers were believed to be a mass in the hundreds, the Nekadzeltaura were said to also work for someone. Their population covered across the entirety of the Nahani Valley, so very little would happen without their knowing. When a group of explorers would breach their territory, they would follow and watch. Eventually, once their targets had ventured far enough in that escaping the valley would take days, they would beckon for someone to come, someone who we had previously discussed before. Harking back to part two, reach into your memories and try to remember the spirit who hunted those who ventured far into its home. The Bad Thing, also known as the So Netai. This specter said to roam the valley at night, infecting anyone it could find with a terrible, deadly disease. It employs the Nekatzeltara to do its bidding, and to seek out those humans foolish enough to enter its home. Working together, the two entities are capable of nefarious devastation on those who are not cautious while in the valley. Perhaps they are simple stories though, meant to keep the curious children of the tribes from running off into the woods and getting lost or they were legends created by the tribes of the valley to scare away any poachers or prospectors who threatened the tribe's way of life. Or maybe they were just folk tales, ways to explain why something had happened when all logical reasons seemed to not make any sense, like the mysterious decapitations of the McLeod brothers and so many more people. Or maybe those entities are real, prowling through the forests and on top of the mountains, just waiting for some unlucky soul to wander too far. Ancient spirits are one thing, and while those spirits can transform into tangible creatures capable of causing a lot of trouble and harm, they aren't the only dangers found in the valley. While the Nekadzeltara can transform into hairy mountain men, they are not the only hairy creatures said to reside in the valley. There are others just as ancient and just as mysterious as the spirits. They are said to inhabit all areas of the globe. Different cultures have different names for the ones who live near them. The Yeti, Yowies, Sasquatch. While Canada is famous for being home to the legendary Bigfoot, the Nahanni Valley is said to be the home of a unique creature belonging to the same family, the Nakanai. Ever since the first inhabitants settled in the Nahanni Valley, Sighting after sighting and story after story have been told of people encountering these wild men on high windy cliffs or in the thick green forests. As is a common theme among these sorts of cryptids, whispers of their identity, their existence, has been questioned among skeptics for hundreds of years. And my goal for this segment is to convince those who would have doubts that the Nakanai, at the very least, were real at some point and were very present in the Nahani Valley. Before the first white man ever set foot in the Nahanni, the local Dene tribes populating the eastern shores of the Mackenzie River, all the way to the western slopes of the Alaskan mountains, spoke of a dangerous breed of wild man said to stalk in the shadows just beyond the light of the campfires at night. They were terrified of these mysterious hairy men, 
and believed them to be as real as the wolf and bear were, and they went to great lengths to avoid crossing paths with any of them. Every summer, a blanket of fear would descend onto the Dene people like an epidemic. They lived in continual terror of these giant enemies, and on those warm sunny mornings when they believed the Nakanai were near, all members of the tribe would retreat and abandon their camps, desperate to distance themselves from these pursuers. They would travel by boat to the safety of a small lake island, believing the Nakanai were incapable of traveling through the water to reach them. There were times, however, when the tribe found themselves too far from any shoreline. So according to a Hudson Bay Company trader named John Firth, who witnessed firsthand the pure fear that gripped the aboriginals, said if they found themselves too far from any shore to retreat onto, they would all stand their ground and fire their musket rifles wildly into the tree line, unable to see their target, but confident the shooting would scare it away. The complete superstition surrounding these wild hairy men was so strong, tribe after tribe in the north spoke of stories about them and would refer to them by their own names. To the Slavey, Casca, and Mountain natives of the Mackenzie country, they referred to them as the Nakanai. But to the Gwich'in people who lived further north on the edge of the Arctic Circle, they called them as the Mahoney. The Koyukon aboriginals living in the Yukon River area knew them as Nakantila. And to the Tananan people of southwest Alaska, they referred to them as the Nantina. The other names commonly shared among the occupants of the frozen north named these mysterious wild men as bad Indians, bellowing men, bushmen, sneakers, and hairy men. But despite all these different labels given by the local aboriginals, one thing stands out which points to the idea that all of these different tribes, some of them being mountains and lakes apart from one another, have all seen the same things. With every tribe, the description of the wild men continue to be eerily consistent, pointing to the idea that the Nakanai are a real race of mountain and forest dwelling creatures who populate all across the frozen north. For the most part of the 19th and 20th century, trappers, prospectors, and trading frontiersmen who travel into the north were warned of the Nakanai. Through various descriptions and sources, those who wrote in their books and journals were under the impression this race of primitive, hairy men were vaguely human in appearance. Aside from their layer of thick, dirty hair coating their entire bodies, they were believed to stand around 10 feet in height. They had bloody red eyes which could glow in the night, long muscular arms and legs that were strong enough to climb the largest of mountains, large feet to grip the rocks with, and were regarded as dangerous cannibals who enjoyed hunting down the native men they would catch in the woods. In English author Michael H. Mason's book, The Arctic Forest, 1924, he writes about the Gwich'in people in the northern Yukon Territory who describe the Nakanai, or the Mahonai as they've named them, as terrible wild men with red eyes and of enormous height, completely covered in long hair. Their tremendous size was attested by the large three-foot-long human-like footprints they left in their wake, as well as their alleged ability to tear entire birch trees from the earth with their bare hands, roots and all. As an inspector for the Hudson Bay Company, Philip Godsell shared a similar account given to him by the Slavey and Casca aboriginals near the Mackenzie Mountains where he spent time in their camps. According to him, the Nakanai were troglodytes, twice the size of ordinary humans who went about naked save for a coating of evil-smelling hair. In other articles describing his writings, he also made comparisons to them as being like gorillas and gargoyles, with superhuman strength and speed. For those frontiersmen who later wrote about their adventures in the Nahanni and Northern Territories, they would claim they would find large footprints similar to humans, but were of incredible size pressed deeply into the hardened snow. When compared, their own footprints would hardly leave any trace in the pack's snowdrifts, but for the creature leaving behind these massive markings, their prints would sink in several inches down, indicating how heavy and massive they really must have been. The aboriginal inhabitants of the Mackenzie country have long maintained that Nahanni Valley was the original home of the Nakanai, and that these fearsome giant monsters resided deep in the heart of the valley, dwelling in hidden caves and in the massive canyons. The Dene who warned of these beasts used to even make reference to the South Nahanni River, the same river Willie and Frank McLeod, and then Martin Jorgensen, all happened to have traveled down in search of gold. 
The Nahadi is a word they use to call the river, which means river of the giants. Could this well-known and frequently traveled river lie in the realm of the Nakanai, hairy giant monsters who lie in wait for eager prospectors to carelessly venture down it, only to catch them off guard while they slept and then tear their heads cleanly from their bodies? Could the South Nahani River be their home? It's mostly agreed upon by the multiple tribes in the north, these creatures seem to live in this general area, but are also known to travel great distances across the territories and into the Alaskan state. They migrate across incredible mountain peaks and through thick forests in search of prey throughout the year, and never seem to tire as they move, seemingly going long periods of time without having to stop for food or water. They're mostly active during the hot summer months, and less so during the spring and autumn ones, but it's when the cold, bitter snow of winter eventually rears its head, the Nakanai finally seem to disappear into the caverns and caves to wait out the freezing temperature, only to emerge from their rocky homes in the spring, hungry and ready to hunt. Some of them are also said to be solitary travelers, moving across the land freely, unhindered by a home or family to bind them to a specific location. However, conflicting legends do tell of them being seen in groups once in a while too, and living in an area over a long period of time. It would seem the Nakanai are similar to that of humans. Some prefer to be left alone, while others enjoy the company of their own kind. A little over a year ago in last November, I had done an episode about Albert Osman, a Swedish prospector traveling through northern British Columbia searching for gold. As he was traveling, his aboriginal guide warned him of the giant hairy mountain men said to populate the woods and lakes in the mountains. But dismissing these warnings as nothing more than just old tales, Albert had pressed on further into the forest. As he tells it, after about a week of living off the land, he was kidnapped by one of these giant mountain men and taken deep into the mountains to live with a family of these hairy creatures. He eventually managed to escape, but the story itself shares some resemblance to the legend of the Nakanai. They just so happened to live a short distance north from where Osman said he was taken from, making the point they were of the same grouping more reasonable to believe. So if we are to believe the Nakanai migrate from place to place, perhaps they are the very same creatures Albert Osman encountered way back in 1924. I mentioned before the aboriginals of the state of Alaska claim they too have sightings of similar creatures, which leads me to harken back to another episode I did about the abandonment of Port Chatham earlier this year. That episode was based around the fishing town of Port Chatham that was said to be completely abandoned overnight by increased attacks by the dreaded Nantanak, a 10-foot tall violent behemoth. Although in that episode I had come to the conclusion that the Nantanak was not a real threat to the town, the countless stories about it suggest perhaps there was something similar to the Nakanai roaming in the woods of Alaska. What leads me to say this is mainly the story I shared in the second episode of that series about a prospector named Charlie who had found himself exploring the Thomas Bay area back in the year 1900. While searching for his lost claim near Half Moon Lake, he was attacked and then chased off the mountain by a group of what he called hairy devils, swarming up the cliff, reaching out for him as they cried and hollered in an awful fashion. Perhaps this group of large hairy ape men spotted near Half Moon Lake were the infamous Nakanai from the Nahani Valley, who had migrated west in search of better hunting grounds. But whether or not these creatures we have covered on previous episodes could be related to the Nakanai is a question yet to have an answer to it. Each story, though, does share some resemblance to how the Nakanai are said to behave. Just like the Nahani tribe were blamed for the mysterious deaths and disappearances that have occurred over the past couple centuries, these hairy creatures were also said to have been guilty of these sort of acts. As legend went, they prowled through the wilds once the sun goes down, searching for any campers or explorers who may have wandered a little too far into their territory. Those unfortunate souls said to fall victim to the Nakanai are often met with two fates. They are either dragged off in the middle of the night, back to these monsters' caves and homes where they would meet a painful and torturous end, or if a Nakanai deemed their prey to present too much trouble in dragging back to their homes, they would quietly descend onto them and swiftly twist, rip, and cut their victim's head cleanly from their bodies, only to keep their heads as trophies. When the Nakanai venture outside the Mackenzie Mountains searching for food, they hunted down traveling natives or exploring prospectors, using the thick forests to their advantage, hiding among the trees and bushes, concealing their whole bodies but keeping their red eyes closely fixed on their targets. They'll follow their soon-to-be victims through the forests, waiting for the perfect opportunity to strike. Having hunted this way for centuries, 
Even the most talented of outdoorsmen or trackers have a difficult time determining what it is that's stalking them, but they'll pick up on the feeling of being watched, just like Charlie McLeod's team had felt as they traversed the Nahanni Wilds in search of Willie and Frank. On those rare occasions the Nakanai are spotted or are found to be in the area, it's the native scouts who are the first ones to notice traces of these mythical giants. The large footprints trampled down in the dirt or the branches high in the trees broken and cracked are the clearest signs one is near. But by this point, upon discovering their presence, the scouts are in immediate danger of being caught by them as they have been isolated and separated from the rest of their group and are perfectly susceptible to kidnapping or killing. There are many times though when the men traveling through the Nahanni are cautious. They stick together and are well aware of the dangers the valley presents. This then presents a special challenge to the Nakanai and their hunts. To combat this, they attempt psychological games with their prey, in hopes they can cause them to run off scared into the woods, making them much easier to pick off one by one. They'll hide in the shadows just beyond the light of the campfires, and the Nakanai will then climb up high into the tall trees, hooping and hollering down at the scared campers below. They might begin throwing rocks or branches down at the men, taunting them to investigate the strange noises, only to jump from tree to tree to avoid being found. When the men have emptied their camp in search of the source of the flying rocks or constant whistling emitted from the trees, the Nakanai will swoop down and raid the camp, stealing away any valuable goods, tools, or fish they can find, and breaking everything they can in the process. It was nearly impossible to defend oneself from a Nakanai attack when one has deemed your camp suitable to raid. They reign as the dominating force in the Nahani Valley, and there are very few who could match their raw strength and violent power. If this behavior sounds familiar, it should, because the Nakanai, to me at the very least, seem to be very similar to a particular lost tribe we discussed last week. The Naha tribe are back. What seems to be the most intriguing to me is their behavior and description is very closely similar to how the Lost Naha tribe were described by the other tribes in the valley. Let's jump back to the last episode when we discussed the Lost Naha tribe. Dene tribesmen who warned early frontiersmen of the danger of venturing into the Mackenzie Mountains described the tribe residing there were fearsome giants, cursed by the gods for their evil and unnatural practices. Just like the Naha tribe, the Nakanai were described as primitive, violent cave dwellers who resorted to cannibalism when their animal prey seemed to dwindle later on in the year. It has also been said in legend, when the Nakanai snuck into the camps in the lowlands, they would oftentimes steal away and abduct the women and daughters who strayed too far from their homes and drag them off kicking and screaming deep into the woods back to their caves. After having engaged in brutal murder and cannibalism over the years, the Nakanai were believed to have gone wild after living in such harsh, brutal conditions. With their separation from the rest of society and horrifying practices, they developed their frightening, grotesque appearance that caused most to believe they were monsters. With their gaunt faces, filthy, unkept long hair, and cracked, dry skin, they were often mistaken for something inhuman. Perhaps it was the lost Nahad tribesmen who abandoned their mountain civilization to only become the wild men known as the Nakanai living and hunting among the forests of the Nahani, causing mayhem in a world that was fast changing and quickly leaving them behind. Still though, the fact so many different aboriginal tribes in so many different locations have stated claims of witnessing these giant creatures who possess unnatural powers and exhibit inhuman qualities are out there is something that should be taken into consideration. These are people who have lived in the wilds of the north centuries before Canada even became a country or Alaska was purchased from Russia. They have experienced and witnessed things some of us could never have imagined seeing. Who knows what really has lived in those woods as recently as the 1800s? Cryptozoologists believe that the Nakanai are quite literally just another cryptid similar to that of Sasquatch, who are said to populate the Canadian wilderness. Or some have theorized they are lost remnants of Neanderthal, or ancient Denisovian humans who were said to have gone extinct 40,000 years ago. 
and others have suggested perhaps they might have been a relative of the Gigantopithecus, an enormous bipedal ape said to have lived around 100,000 years ago in Southeast Asia. The theory behind this is that perhaps this ape had traveled all the way across the Bering Strait hundreds of centuries ago, just as the first humans once had when they first entered North America. It should also be noted that just on the other side of what used to be the Bering Strait, in what is now northeastern Russia, fossil remnants of Denisovian humans and Neanderthals have been found and dated to be as old as the same time as Homo sapiens who also lived in that same area. Folklore in this area also states that the Altai Mountains in Central Asia and the boreal forests of Siberia are home to another subhuman known to be incredibly large, strong, and hairy, known as the Almas and the Chechenya. Perhaps it was this group of mountain-dwelling creatures who ventured across the strait thousands of years ago who then made their home in the Nahani Valley, peacefully living until humans eventually clashed with them, leading to the legend of the Nakani to be born into fruition. Of course, with any hint of a cryptid being found, there should be stories and tales that go along with it. Fortunately for us, this just so happens to be the case with the Nakani. People for centuries have shared oral tales of these elusive beasts, including that of white men who dared explore this harsh area of the world. John McLeod, who you might remember from last week's episode, had his own encounter with what some believe to have been one of these legendary wild men. While he and his expedition were traveling up the west branch of the Liard River in the summer of 1831, they pitched their tents to make camp for the night. While the group were resting by the fire after a long tiresome day of trekking through the forests, they began to hear what sounded like two large footsteps skulking through the woods just beyond eyesight. Thinking perhaps it was just another Nahani native scout watching their group in camp, they didn't really think much of it. That is, until a little later into the night when the group of men began falling asleep one by one. Whatever was out there had begun whistling, and then tossing stones at the tired, and now understandably, very annoyed men. Still though, they just chalked it up to being one of the Nahani natives who populated the area, probably just trying to get to them. But as legend says, just like the Sasquatch, the whistling and tossing stones is a common practice for these mythical giants. This behavior would seem to suggest John McLeod and his men all possibly had an encounter with a Nakani, and they didn't even realize it. This next story tells us of a quick but clear sighting of a Nakani coming from a native man by the name of Paul Peters. According to George Erbhard, in his 2002 book titled Mysterious Creatures, A Guide to Cryptozoology, he writes about how on a fishing trip in August of 1960, Peters had been outside at his fishing camp, along with two of his dogs about 10 miles down the Yukon River from the town of Ruby, Alaska. While he was casting his line into the water, Peters had witnessed the strangest sight. A broad-shouldered, very muscular creature walking on two legs like a man emerged out of the tree line a little way down the river from him and was heading in his direction. His dogs were a little ways away from him but noticed the creature as well. Commonly, dogs who grow up living in and near the wilds of Alaska are rarely afraid of any animal who prowls the woods, but as Peters put it, both of them were whining and acting very strangely. Peters continued to watch this large, nearly seven foot tall hairy man walk closer and closer to his dogs, but stopped in place when it noticed him on the shoreline placing down his fishing rod, unblinking from its sudden appearance. As soon as Peters began to move, his dogs worked up their courage again and began barking at the creature viciously, causing the Nakani to swiftly turn on its heels and make its way up a steep cliff overlooking the river, where it disappeared and was never seen again. Ten years later in 1970, a Koyukon woman named Patty Nolnar, along with six other companions from the small village of Nalato, Alaska, all believed they were visited by a Nakani while camping on the shores of the Koyoka River. Similar to the experience John McLeod and his expedition team had, the group were sitting around the campfire enjoying their evening when all of a sudden, they were besieged by a hail of hard stones being thrown at them from behind the tree line. Although none of them got a good look at it, they were convinced that because they were in such an isolated area where no one else would have been, and the size of the rocks and just how hard they were being thrown, that nothing else in the woods could have accomplished that aside from something with two very large hands and arms. Our last story comes to us from one of his many letters written about his adventures in the Nahani. Poole Field recorded his own dramatic account of the time he and the group he was traveling with had a run-in with one of these giant hairy men. At the time of this letter being written, it was 1914, 
the same year he and Oscar would set out to search for Martin Jorgensen. But as we know in that story, the two weren't able to find the man that year. But it was in that year, the two, along with the chief, Jim Pellissey, and his band of natives, all seem to have experienced the same antics these Nakanai seemed to enjoy pulling. It was late one night, as the group had already gone off to sleep in their tents, somewhere along the South Nahani River, when the company was visited by a single shy Nakanai, who remained hidden in the forest shadows. When it was sure the men had all seemed to have gone off to bed, the creature snuck up close to the camp, ensuring it was careful enough not to be spotted or be caught off guard. When it was close enough, it began throwing sticks at the tents pitched on the outskirts of the site, which Poole then writes, struck terror in the women residents. It was probably with these screams of terror did the dogs sleeping in the camp spring awake and were able to hone in on the creature's scent, giving its location away as they barked and tug on their rope leashes, attempting to chase it off. But by the time the hunters of the group were able to emerge from their tents with their rifles drawn, the Nakanai had seemingly slipped away back into the shadows of the forest and disappeared completely without a trace. It wasn't until the next night, and the night after that, and the one after that, that the Nakanai repeatedly appear and continue its routine of throwing rocks and branches at the camp's occupants. It would holler and whistle as it did so, seemingly taunting the men who couldn't see past the glow of the fires. Spotting the faint sight of a branch being hurled from the darkness and land onto one of the teepees, the men with their rifles would rush over to the location the wood was thrown from, but by that time the Nakanai would either have retreated back into the woods or appear on the other side of the camp, continuing its assault. This was taking its toll on the tired and restless occupants of the camp, so Poole, along with Oscar and two other native men, decided to sneak out into the woods one night with their weapons and hope the creature would stumble onto the group of four. Somehow though, night after night it seemed this creature had the unnatural ability to sense where they were and outright avoided them wherever they went. However, luck was on their side one night, and while Poole and Oscar were out on their nightly patrols, the pair spotted a large hulking figure standing high on a gravel bar, looking over the camp. Both the men quickly raised their 30-30 rifles and began taking shots at the figure standing a short distance away. But as quickly as it appeared, with unnatural speed, the Nakanai vanished into the night. In the coming days, the entire camp would continue their way down the South Nahani River. After shooting and acquiring 12 moose, to which they used their skins to help construct large canoes for the whole group to travel by, even with the fast-moving water and the fact they were unhindered by any of the forest foliage, the Nakanai that had been harassing the group was still able to keep pace with them by running along the shoreline and behind the trees. Despite the increasingly frustrated sentries watching over the camp at night, none of them were able to hit the creature with their rifles, or scare it off for good. Following one of the mornings after a night of trying to repel this harasser, Poole led a small team into the woods to try and track the beast, but to their dismay, found the creature who had been harassing them every night for over a week was now accompanied by five other similar giants, by evidence of the six sets of imposing footprints found in the dirt next to one another. There were a good deal of speculation on who they were and what they wanted, later wrote Poole. Most everyone had made a speech in the night inviting whoever it was to come in daylight and he or them would be treated right. We spoke in two or three of the Mackenzie dialects and I gave them in Peli, Liard, and Yukon, as well as English but nothing doing. They would not answer. Time would continue to go on with the occasional visit from these mysterious people, but the group were running out of food. Poole, along with eight other hunters, decided it would be best to cross to the other side of the South Nahani River in an attempt to hunt for moose or caribou on the opposite side. We had killed two moose and was having a cup of tea, wrote Poole, when we noticed a big smoke from where our camps were. Shortly after, a number of shots fired quick. We knew this was either a signal for us to return or that some strangers had arrived. We listened for a few moments and we could hear no answering shots, so I fired two shots off. They were answered at once from our main camp, so we knew that we were wanted. Realizing something important was happening, Poole and his eight men moved as fast as they could through the forest and hurried across the river. When they pushed past the final branches that opened up to their camp, they were met with the startling sight of the entire camp congregated in the middle and were visibly very upset. But seeing nothing was inherently wrong, the group of hunters slowly approached the large group to ask what they had summoned them for. Apparently, an 18-year-old hunter named Chibu had managed to shoot and kill the Nakanai, who had been causing them so much grief for the past two weeks. With bated breath, a wide-eyed Chibu recounted his story to Poole and his men. 
I was following along a small creek by myself when I heard someone following me. I stopped and waited, but the man also stopped. I looked back and I could see no one was among the trees. So I began running, and whoever it was ran after me. The undergrowth was thick and I couldn't see far. I was so scared, with shaking fingers I slipped around into the breech of my rifle and slammed the bolt handle forward. As I was doing so, I stumbled into a small opening of trees and ran into the middle. I turned around and suddenly a strange looking man appeared from behind me and stepped into the clearing. I yelled for him to stop, but he didn't listen and began rushing towards me, so I shot him and knocked him down. The wounded man began bellowing and calling out in a strange language, and I turned around and ran the other way and never stopped until I got back to camp. Poole looked around the camp and saw many of the people had begun packing up their belongings, ready to head out on the canoes once more to put as much distance as they could from the now injured or dead creature Chibu had shot. But after a bit of convincing, Poole managed to get most of the people to hold off on retreating for just a little longer, while he, Oscar, Chief Pelissey, and a skilled tracker with the name Bigfoot coincidentally enough, went out to investigate the location Chibu said where he had shot the beast. While they tried their best to convince Chibu to guide them to the correct location, nothing could ease his fears or nerves enough for him to agree. But Bigfoot, being the best tracker in the camp, assured Poole that he would be able to find the young boy's path and lead them to where he claimed to have shot the Nakanai. So, while the rest of the camp continued to pack up to continue their journey, a single canoe was left behind for the four men who slowly trekked into the woods towards the direction Chibu told them to go. The four had to take great care as to move as silently as they could through the brush to avoid any kind of ambush from any reinforcements who might have come after the Nakanai had given out its call for help. To his credit, Bigfoot was actually quite quick in finding the small clearing described by Chibu, and after peering into the clearing for some time, he signaled to the rest that the coast was clear, and the small group cautiously walked into the opening. It was here they found the remains of something incredibly large, having been laying in the long grass, with a thick layer of red blood replacing the green. It was clear Chibu had been telling the truth, and their assumptions of the others coming to rescue their fallen Nakanai had been true too. Just off to the side of the area where the body had fallen, two sets of footprints, belonging to other Nakanai, seemed to appear and carry off their wounded friend. Poole and his team decided to follow the trail of large footprints to see where the creatures might have gone, but after about a mile and a half, they gave up after finding two other creatures with equally large feet had joined the three they were tracking. Thinking perhaps it might not be a good idea to continue to track any further now, now that they were outnumbered, the four men determined it best to turn around and head back to their canoe and row further down the South Nahani to meet up with the rest of the camp. As they arrived, they were surprised to find one of the young girls of the camp had come down with something. Even the group's shaman couldn't figure out what ailed her. The strange practices Poole witnessed done to her didn't seem to have any effect in lowering the girl's mysterious illness. While she looked fine on the outside, she had explained an immense pain coming from within her. On a hunch, the shaman instructed her to reveal and confess any dark secrets that might have been lingering in her mind. And with the insistence and encouragement by the girl's parents and her husband, she explained she had been involved in an affair with the son of a Casca chief in the upper Liard River camp. She revealed while the two were on one of their secret meetups in the early spring, the son promised he would come and steal her away so the two could be together. She then revealed to everyone it was he, along with his group of friends, who had been stalking through the woods, attempting to scare everyone off while she was supposed to discreetly run to him and escape. The only reason she wasn't able to was because during the night attacks, her mother kept her confined to the tent to protect her. Puzzling enough, her sickness seemed to disappear once she shared her story. It was probably just a case of guilt and sadness after hearing Chibu had shot and possibly killed the man in the woods. Needless to say, she found herself in quite a bit of trouble with her husband, parents, and the chief that night, but if this was really what happened, Poolfield's writings about the mystery of the Nakanai attacking his camp seem to have been tied up in a nice little bow for us. Whether or not the Nakanai were really responsible for any of these stories, the fact remains they are all born from something. The people in this region of the world 
firmly believed the Nakanai were a very real and very dangerous threat who stalked through the woods at night, ready to kidnap or kill anyone they caught or came across. Even through all the years, there are still some people out there who believe this hairy giant is still freely roaming. Although sightings of this massive creature could usually be associated with common Bigfoot or Sasquatch sightings, there are still those who live in the frozen territories who believe the Nakanai are still populating the north. On July 28th of 2016, the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, published an article describing a Nakanai encounter with a man named Tony Willa, a man from the settlement of Hwati in the Northwest Territories. Earlier that same month, Willa had been out boating on Lac La Marte, the third largest lake in the Northwest Territories. At some point in his journey, he spotted what looked like a plastic bag bobbing in the water, and being the type of person he was, he wasn't about to let trash just float around in this pristine paradise. He leaned over the side of his boat to grab the bag, but a rogue wave came up as he was doing so, tossing him over the side and capsizing his boat. Struggling to get back into his boat and out of the freezing water, Willa decided to quickly swim to a nearby island, where he would hunker down and attempt to quickly warm himself before succumbing to illness. Even in the middle of summer, these waters can still be freezing, and can quickly cause anyone submerged in it to fall to hypothermia. Exhausted from the swim, Willa collapsed on the rocky shore of the island, but all of a sudden, there was a large man standing right beside him on that secluded beach. Willa was speechless as he watched the man look down at him, then turned away and walked away into the thick woods. He was so stunned at what he witnessed, he couldn't move, and ended up spending two full days on the shore before rescue finally arrived and saved him. He was quickly rushed to the closest hospital by the RCMP, where he made a full recovery, but he later claimed during his entire time spent on that island, he didn't sleep a wink, constantly looking over his shoulder for the man he was sure was watching from the shadows. Now, his experience could have been a genuine encounter with a wild man like the Nakanai, but others have pointed out his experience sounds like a case of what has been called third man syndrome. This is a phenomenon reported by explorers, outdoor athletes, and disaster survivors in which a mysterious guardian angel-like figure will suddenly appear out of seemingly nowhere during times of extreme difficulty to offer some form of comfort or guidance. In Willa's tired, disoriented state, it is possible this could have been what he experienced, but what happened to two ladies back in 2012, way over in northern Quebec, the circumstances were quite different. Just outside the small village of Aklavik, Maggie Kingalik and her friend were out picking berries when both spotted the clear figure of a large man covered in long black hair marching across the tundra towards them. We weren't sure what it was at first, said Kingalik. It is not a human being. He was really tall and kept coming towards our direction, and we could tell it was not human. Later giving her best estimate, she determined the creature to be roughly around 3 meters or 10 feet tall, and the footprints which were later found measured to be around 40 centimeters or nearly 16 inches long. Whatever it was that was spotted way out in Quebec fits the description of the Nakanai and also that of Sasquatch known to populate Alberta and British Columbia. With the north of Canada being incredibly underpopulated, freely moving from one side to the country to the other without being seen would surprisingly be very simple. Canada is, after all, the second largest country in the world, with a population of only 38 million people, 90% of which live within 150 kilometers from the United States border. For a large creature like the Nakanai to live unnoticed and undiscovered for so long in the Northern Territories, it definitely wouldn't surprise me if there were more things living up there we are not aware of. Like I've said in some previous episodes, some have compared the Nahanni Valley as a tropical oasis among a frozen wasteland, unchanged from how it once was thousands of years ago. If we take into consideration how void of human life the valley truly is, perhaps we could take into account that even more creatures reside there, living in the caves and caverns that lead deep into the earth, completely undocumented and against all odds, have survived long after they were expected to have gone extinct.
Stories of magnificent beasts roaming the Nahenni Valley have dated back centuries before even the first white man crossed its borders. And I'm not necessarily talking about creatures like the Nakanai or the Nekatzeltara. These creatures are actually real, though they were supposed to have gone extinct long ago. You see, what helps make the Nahanni Valley such a perfect place for creatures to live and hide in is because not only does the entire valley span across 30,000 square kilometers, making it an incredibly large area that has remained mostly untouched over the years, but also because of the unique geological makeup of the valley that has protected it. Millions of years ago, the formations of the vast mountain ranges that surround the valley have protected it during the Glacian, Calabrian, Ionian, and Teraton Ice Ages ensuring that the large destructive glacial ice sheets that shaped most of North America remained outside of the valley, leaving it untouched in that regard, and meaning the creatures living there were also left relatively unaffected. This made the Nahanni a perfect place for eager paleontologists searching for fossilized remains of plants and fauna to find, and of course, there were plenty of creatures who once lived here. But, as legends grew, stories of these giant monsters still alive to this day have popped up from time to time. In one of his many articles and writings about the Nahanni Valley, Philip Godsell told of a story that had been shared with him by a man by the name of Frank Beaton. While conducting scientific surveys and expeditions into the Nahanni, Frank, along with his science team, were told a story from their aboriginal guide named Chikina, and in turn, he had heard the story from his father. Chikina's father enjoyed to wander, and at one point he found himself traveling to the upper Liard River where he met up with what he called was a primitive tribe. The group sat around the campfire sharing stories of their travels when the Stone Age people told of a place they called Medicine Valley, located further north from where they sat. In Medicine Valley lived ferocious giant monsters, who they had tried hunting but had proved to be too dangerous to attempt any further. One of them then produced a scrap of buckskin out of their bags, etched and burned onto the skin, was an image of a monster. Somehow, Chikina's father managed to obtain the buckskin depiction and treasured it for years until his death, on which the buckskin was then passed down to his son. When he finished telling his tale, Chikina reached into his travel sack and pulled out the very same buckskin drawing for Frank and his science team to study. The figure that was depicted on the skin was obvious to the science team. What the aboriginal had claimed was a monster was a flawless, anatomically correct drawing of a dinosaur. When thinking about the Ice Ages and the creatures affected by them, which one seems to stand out and represent that era more than any other? The Woolly Mammoth. The iconic hairy giants who roamed across the frozen tundra searching for warmer climates to call home. These nomadic beasts were believed to have gone extinct as recently as around 4,000 years ago, but there are some who believe that Nahanni Valley and the surrounding area may have played refuge to some who were escaping the ever-changing climate and were able to find salvation deep in the valley where the hot springs fed and preserved that natural foliage they desperately needed to survive. Proof of their existence in the valley can be found in the ancient footprints left behind, baked into the hard stone wandering all throughout the Nahanni. Although chances of them still wandering are slim, remains of multiple mammoths have been found throughout the years. A Yukon prospector named Angus Graham, back in 1898, claimed to have come across the frozen corpse of a young mammoth still encased in its icy tomb. Those who traveled north for the various gold rushes throughout the years have also claimed they have come across the bones and skulls of animals they said who have vanished from the face of the earth long ago. Remains of mammoths, mastodons, ancient deer, and much more have been discovered embedded in the frozen landscape. Mammoth remains have actually been found to be so abundant here, one could even acquire trinkets made from their tusks. My point being, if massive creatures like mammoths were able to survive and outlast the Ice Age here in the Nahanni, perhaps there were other creatures who had managed to survive as well. In Dene mythology, they tell of many stories about giant monstrous animals, which they referred to as Yaradai, who traveled the world centuries ago. They lived underground or beneath the lakes and rivers, and every once in a while, the people of the tribes would come across their bones that had washed the shore. Now being called Yaradai, you might think this is a new form of animal or creature. Well, you might not be too far off, but most Yaradai are creatures considered to be giant versions of the typical animals found in the Nahanni. For an example, Dene legends tell of ferocious beavers who wandered around, killing or terrorizing any natives they happened to run into. It was said there were actually three known groups. 
One group was living on Lake Athabasca in northern Alberta and Saskatchewan, another group resided in the Great Slave Lake area near Yellowknife, and another group were said to inhabit the Liard River in the south of the Nahanni Valley. This almost certainly sounds like the ancient giant beavers known as the Cassaroides, who were thought to have gone extinct over 10,000 years ago. If sightings and encounters with giant beavers had happened fairly recently, like in the past few hundred years or so, perhaps there have been other creatures who have survived longer in this area, that we as humans had previously thought to have gone extinct. Interestingly enough, there is another Yaradai called Nuutai, who was said to resemble that of a modern-day elephant, but was incredibly large and hairy. Elephants aren't native to North America, let alone the frozen tundra of Canada's north. The aboriginals of that time would have had no reference to our modern-day elephants. So, if sightings and encounters of the Nuutai have been as recent as within the past 1,000 years even, chances are these creatures were very likely to have been woolly mammoths, leading me to believe the natives of the Nahanni had seen or encountered them as recently as within the past few centuries. This theory is supported by a man named Ed Farrell. In his book, Strange Stories of Alaska and the Yukon, he wrote about an article first published in May of 1889 in the Philadelphia Press. A fur trader named Cola F. Fowler described a story about his adventures in Alaska back in 1887. He had met with the chief of a local Inuit band and proceeded to look over and inspect the ivory tusks the group had acquired from their previous recent hunts. As he was looking over the provided stock, he came across two of the largest tusks he had ever seen, both of which still had blood and flesh attached to it. Questioning the chief on where he had obtained these two incredibly large pieces of ivory, the chief told him three months prior he and a handful of his hunters had encountered a small herd of mammoths about 50 miles north from where they stood. Fowler, obviously thinking he misheard or misunderstood what the chief just told him, asked the man to explain himself again and to describe the creature he hunted in great length. In the soft clay of the riverbank, the chief took a sharp stick and began drawing a picture of the creature he and his men had taken down. Explaining in more details as he drew, the chief explained while hunting, the creature made a loud, shrill trumpet-like call that resembled that of a woolly mammoth with long brown hair. Though in his drawing, while it did resemble kind of like a mammoth, it did seem to have quite small ears, very large eyes, and a long slender trunk. It was close, but just a little different than the typical mammoth appearance. Curiously, the creature also had four four-foot tusks protruding from its head, as well as two additional curved 15-foot long tusks, the very ones Fowler had commented on that spurred this entire conversation. Now this kind of sounds like a woolly mammoth, but more so it sounds more like a eubelodon, a four-tusked relative to the mammoth that had gone extinct long before it. The eubelodon was unknown to science at the time of the chief telling the story to Fowler. So could these giant, long extinct creatures actually have been around as recently as the past two or three hundred years? Living in such a vast and unpopulated area of the earth, anything could live out there without being spotted or discovered for years. There are more strange tales of humongous creatures spanning from giant bears the size of trains to moose and caribou resembling the size of ancient Irish elk. All of these have appeared over and over again throughout the years by those living in the frozen northern territories. There's even some mention of an appearance of the world's largest feline being present in the valley. Now when I say that, you might be thinking of a lion or a tiger, but this giant cat was actually one believed to have gone extinct roughly around 10,000 years ago. The American cave lion stood on all fours at a height of 1.2 meters tall, or 4 feet tall, and 2.5 meters or 8 feet long. It weighed around 230 kilograms, or 500 pounds, and these cats were roughly around 25% larger than that of our modern day lions. They were said to be able to bring down bears, moose, and mammoths with ease, and were incredibly skilled in stalking their prey, waiting for their chance to strike. If we are to take the stories of the mammoths or relatives to the mammoth into consideration, that they could have possibly have lived for a lot longer than we previously believed, would it be crazy to assume these lions, who are significantly smaller than mammoths, to have survived for just as long? Could the beasts who have been dubbed as the Nahanni lions still exist today, prowling through the forests, stalking their prey, just waiting for the right moment to pounce on their victim? Could these apex predators be the ones guilty of the horrifying deaths and disappearances that plague the valley? The theory of prehistoric creatures residing here 
is one that strikes interest in many inquisitive people around the world. The idea of these creatures still roaming the Nahani, while is interesting, it does lack any kind of substantial evidence. The only reason why this is a theory in the first place is because time and time again, stories from the local aboriginal tribes and those brave explorers who enter the valley often claim to encounter or witness strange large creatures moving through the thick woods. But I will admit, the Nahani Valley is a unique place. Of all the places in the world, all the massive parks, and out of all the lost paradises, the Nahani Valley holds true to its reputation, and continues to surprise us with each passing year and with each story told. If there really is prehistoric monsters prowling through the valley, hopefully it's only a matter of time before evidence of their supposed existence comes forth, and we could finally put one of these mysteries to rest. The folklore and legends of the Nahani Valley tell of so many stories of wild men and strange creatures living here and in the surrounding areas. So many, in fact, we would be here all night if we attempted to go into every single one of them. There's the Tingju Ru, a very tall, thin wild man with a black face and crazy yellow eyes, the Na'in, a group of invisible giant wild men, the Kashtaka, evil tricksters who are known to shapeshift from otters to humans and then back again, a creature known as the Glacial Demon, said to cause avalanches and snowstorms to trap and freeze travelers, a race of ancient giant people known as the Tunajuk, the Mongol Caves, a place where many creatures and entities are said to dwell, and of course there are the very famous cryptids known as the Wendigo, a creature widely known and one I will be covering in a future episode very soon, and the Wahila, a wolf-bear hybrid cryptid said to be present here will also be a future episode at one point. With all of these, along with the Nekatzaltara, the spirits of the Nahani Valley and the Nakanai, one could believe there's no safe area while exploring Canada's north. And one might be right to assume this. All of these different folklores have to come from somewhere. Some might be born into the world through simple stories and lessons used to teach or warn younger members of all the tribes living out there, but there are also creatures out there who have seemingly been witnessed and encountered by so much and so often, one might have to ask the difficult question, what if they're real? What if creatures like the Naked Zeltara or like the Nakanai are really out there somewhere, hunting, kidnapping, and decapitating those unfortunate souls who had the bad luck of running into one of them? Stories of both the Naked Zeltara and the Nakanai hunting humans down once they enter the valley relate to so many stories and feelings people get when they first enter and feel invisible eyes watching them from beyond the trees. The stories told by the Aboriginal residents of the North believe these creatures to be as real as any other creature said to inhabit the valley. They firmly believe the Nakanai are hairy, intimidating giants capable enough to rip the heads off of any person they catch. The Naked Zeltara delight in causing mayhem for whoever they come across, casting spells on their victims only to then steal them away and bring them back to their caves for nefarious reasons. The giant prehistoric predators and creatures said to have a vendetta against any human they come across also seem to be believed by the aboriginals to be very much present in the valley. They follow their instinct in nature, and hunt anyone ignorant of the dangers lurking just beyond the light of their campfires. Whatever has been happening in the Nahani Valley for the past several centuries has remained a mystery ever since the stories have been first shared. The disappearances, the deaths, and the decapitations have all been caused by one thing or another, and all three could be attributed to the many different things we've talked about throughout the past four episodes. The wrath of nature itself, starving wild animals, jealous prospectors searching for gold, mad trappers, evil spirits lurking in the night, old curses shrouding over the valley, lost tribes, vengeful aboriginals, devils residing in the mountains, large hairy creatures traveling through the territories, and finally prehistoric dinosaurs out on the hunt. Any of these, or all of these, could have had some play in the three. But there is still so much more. 
Just like the Nahani Valley, the amount of lost information and possible theories seem to be nearly endless. This lost oasis remains a paradise of complete mystery that will likely never be fully understood. The colorful characters who bless us with their stories should be praised in bringing the Nahani Valley to life. Without them, the foundations of all the legends we had discussed over the course of these four episodes would likely not exist. This mystical land would never be as recognized for what it really is. A paradise in Canada's north. A place so remote, there are no roads that lead to it. No airports to fly into. A pristine land forever protected by the legends that reside there. And the soft blanket of morning fog that rains down from the mountains, only to hide the lush forest below, giving an aurora of both mystery and romance. It's easy to believe while watching the heavy fog roll in, or listening to the dew drip from the dark spruce trees, that somewhere out there, there could be lost gold waiting to be found once more, or unbelievable creatures lying in wait, ready to be discovered. Whatever is truly out there though, I think we can all agree, there is no place quite like the Nahani National Park. It's hard to believe we're finally at the end of the series. This topic has been one incredibly dear to my heart simply because I love doing it. The research, the writing, and the recording of this series has been incredible to do and the positive response I've gotten from all of you, the listeners, have been so satisfying. It's kind of a bittersweet moment right now though, as much as I love the Nahani Valley series and happy it's all wrapped up, I'm gonna miss it. Perhaps someday we'll make a return trip to this topic. As I mentioned in the end there, there's still an unbelievable number of topics we can talk about relating to it. Chances are, we will return. So if you're feeling down that this topic is over, don't worry, because I do plan on bringing it back to the podcast at some point in the future. But for now, we need to move on and get into other topics. The next episode is going to be coming out during the holiday, so of course it will be holiday themed, so be sure to stay tuned for that. I also have some topics lined up to start off the new year with, so be sure to stick around to hear those. I also want to mention the amazing source I had for this series. The book titled Legends of the Nahani Valley by author Hammerson Peters was incredibly valuable in bringing the stories of the Nahani Valley to life and to you. There is so much written in this book, I honestly would say I covered maybe about half of what's in there. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about the Nahani Valley, I can't recommend this book enough. I bought my copy at a local bookstore, but I've also seen it on Amazon. So if you're interested, I'll post a picture of the cover of the book on the Instagram page so you can be sure you're getting the right copy if you choose to buy it. If at any time you enjoyed listening to the show or of the Nahani Valley series, I ask if you're listening on an Apple product to please leave a 5-star review for the show. Not only does this help support the show by giving it a good rating so more people can find it and it rises in the charts, but it's also a huge confidence booster for me that helps encourage me to continue to bring strange stories and mysterious cryptids to your ears. If you happen to enjoy the show and are looking forward to hearing more, be sure to follow or subscribe to the show on whatever app you're listening on. For those of you who want to go a step further in supporting the show, sharing it among your friends and family is the absolute best way in supporting it at this time. If you do happen to bring up Moonlight lore, the holiday season is quickly approaching and it's the perfect time to do so. Everyone is traveling to different locations to visit friends and family, and maybe to make their travel a bit more tolerable, listening to this series or any other episode I've done, might just make their travel a bit better. Of course, though, as always, I deeply appreciate you all just listening to the show, so thank you for doing that. If at any time you wish to contact me, you can email me at moonlightlorepodcast at gmail.com, or you can direct message me on Instagram at moonlightlorepodcast. 
I absolutely love hearing from you guys, so please don't hesitate to reach out, even if it's just to say hi. But I think that's about it, for now at least. This series was so incredibly amazing to do, and I honestly think it's left a lasting impression on me to the point where I am. I will actually want to go visit the Nahanni Valley someday in the future. I live in Alberta, so really all I'd have to do is just drive straight north until I reach Fort Simpson, I think. But that's a drive that would literally take 24 hours for me to do, and so it's something I'm hesitant on doing. But maybe a flight would be better. But yeah, anyways, thank you guys for listening to my Legends of the Nahanni Valley series. I really hope you enjoyed it. And as always, take care of yourselves, and I'll see you next time. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you.